I'm going to tell you right up front that I've been praying that God would create a thirst in you tonight. Amen. That He would create a hunger in you. A hunger so great that nothing in this world could fill it. And you'd be forced to run to Jesus to get it filled. A hunger. A passion. I want to tell you tonight that I want... I, I, I am... So glad I'll be 50 this year. And I've lived, I've been preaching for 33 years. And I thank God every day that I've lived a life of passion. I've lived a life of passionate pursuit of Jesus. Not perfectly, not even close. And not consistently. But the general rule of my life for the last 33 years has been a passionate pursuit for Jesus. I came home from that camp and I began to read my Bible like there was no tomorrow. I remember my brother and I would stay up all night sometimes. We heard some old preacher say that you should pray all night if you wanted to have a revival. And we'd stay up all night long and pray. And when we got tired of praying, we'd read the book of Acts. And I remember one night we read the whole book of Acts and uh, until the sun came up. And we'd punch each other in the arm when we got sleepy. And uh, stay awake. We've got to have a revival. We've got we to pray all night. And you know what? God began to use us. We had such a crazy passion for the Lord that we would go to our high school in the middle of the night dressed all in black and we'd have collected all these gospel tracts and we'd take them in duffel bags and we'd drop down in the ceiling of our high school because it had atriums where the trees grew up through. We'd drop down in the ceiling of our 3,500 student high school in the middle of the night and we'd put a track in every vent in every locker in the school all night long. I don't recommend that. Don't try this at home. But we were desperate for God to do something. We were desperate. We were passionate. We were crazy in love with Jesus. And we saw every day all these teenagers that didn't know Him that were trying to, to, to inject joy into their arm, that were cutting themselves, that were doing all these things. And we knew the answer. And we had to get the message out. A life of passion. As I was reading my Bible, I came across a passage of Scripture in Psalm chapter 63. My favorite chapter in the Bible. Hardly a day goes by I don't quote a portion of this chapter. And Psalm 63 starts out with, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. As in a dry and weary land where no water is to see your power and your glory. As I've seen you in the sanctuary. Verse 9 says, My soul follows hard after you. Another version says, My soul clings to you. That's the life of passion. A life of passion starts with the decision to passionately pursue Jesus. To not live a mediocre life. I remember hearing the verse as a young, young man. Hearing the verse in Revelation that says, God wants you cold or lukewarm or, or hot, but not lukewarm. If you're cold, He can touch you and make you hot. If you're hot, then you're serving Him with all of your heart. But if you're lukewarm, you think you're hot. You ever been in lukewarm water and you thought it was hot? And then you touched hot water? And then you, oh, you touched cold water? And you realized it was just lukewarm. I remember hearing that and thinking, I am I'm lukewarm. I'm not cold. I'm not horrible. That's what I thought anyway at the time. But I'm not hot for God. And I want to challenge you tonight to be hot for God. I have tried. I have lived a life that, that I can say I've tried to be hot for God. And it's made all the difference. If you have a Bible tonight, I want you to open to Mark chapter 1 and verse 16. Mark chapter 1 and verse 16. Or if it's on your phone, or if not, I'm going to read it, so don't worry about it. Mark chapter 1 and verse 16. My old pastor used to say, if you haven't found it yet, just look intelligently at whatever page you're on and nobody will know the difference. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And the next verse is one of the most amazing in the Bible to me. And they left their nets at once and followed him. And they left their nets at once 
and followed him. Now you have to picture this. All they had ever known was fishing on the Sea of Galilee. This was their whole life. And one day a rabbi comes by and says, follow me. And they leave everything they've ever known. They drop their nets and they just walk away. Wow. I want to tell you tonight that the first part that I think of when I think of a life of passion is reckless courage. Reckless courage. Come on, Brother Robert. Reckless courage. Sometimes we think of reckless most of the time as a bad thing. But when it comes to obeying Jesus the first time, recklessness is a good thing. Reckless courage. 23 times Jesus says, follow me in the Gospels. You say, Brother Matt, I've been in, living in, in San Mateo, in Ambergris Key, Belize, all my life. How am I going to follow Jesus among the nations? Yeah, it's easy for you to say, you, you're from the United States. But all I've ever known is this place. Well, let me tell you something. These lowly fishermen, these lowly fishermen, all they had ever known was the Sea of Galilee. Right? All they had ever known was fishing on the Sea of Galilee. They weren't any different than the fishermen that live in, in Belize. All they had was a boat and some nets. That's all they had. And they left it. They dropped it and they followed Jesus. I want you to think of a line. Look at look look with me here. I want you to think of a, a line marked on this floor right here. And I want you to think of yourself standing on this side of the line. And this line represents the farthest. <laughs> this line represents the farthest. Look at me. They're cute, but, and I'm not near that cute. I can't compete with that. But listen to me for a moment. That line represents the farthest you have ever gone in reckless courage for God. I don't know what that line is, but it represents the farthest you've ever gone in reckless courage for God. Maybe this mission trip is the farthest you've ever gone in reckless courage to God. I don't know what it is. But I want to tell you this. That a life of passion is always just on the other side of that line. Because on this side of the line, there's normalcy. On this side of the line, there is no faith required. Because I've already done everything on this side. I'm comfortable on this side. There's no new challenges. There's nothing risky. There's nothing scary. I can handle everything on this side of the line. This is what we call the comfort zone. But the miracle gap is on that side of the line. And when we step across the line into reckless courage, when those fishermen who all they had ever known was the Sea of Galilee dropped their nets. They crossed over that line. And if you're a glass half empty kind of person, you might say that was the worst decision of their life because all of them, with the exception of John, were murdered as a result of stepping across that line. But if you're a glass half full kind of person, you might say, think about what their lives would have missed if they hadn't stepped across that line. Now let me ask you a, per a question. Would they have been bad people if they didn't cross the line? No. They'd have been average people. What would they have missed if they hadn't crossed the line? They wouldn't have seen Jesus transfigured on the mountain. 
They wouldn't have seen people healed. They wouldn't have seen the, uh, uh, been able to observe the blind eyes open. They wouldn't have seen Lazarus rise from the dead. They wouldn't have seen Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. They wouldn't have gone over the then known world. Do you know that the average fisherman on the Sea of Galilee never traveled more than 30 miles from his home in his entire life? And these men went all over the then known world. Yes, they were killed for their faith, but look at the places they were killed, like India and Ethiopia and all over the world. They had the adventure of a lifetime. Guess what? In 2015, all 12 of them would have been dead by now anyway. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. They'd have been dead anyway. They followed reckless courage and they walked away from everything they ever knew and followed Jesus that's a life of passion you can't live a life of passion without reckless courage I remember as a boy 16 years old 17, 18 I lived at the foot of a mountain and I would go up on top of that mountain I'd take my little hatchet with me and I would chop down pine boughs and I'd make a little prayer hood up, hut on the top of the mountain. And I'd stay up there all night sometimes and I'd walk up and down that mountain and I'd cry out to God and I'd say, Oh God, I want to live a life of passion. Oh God, I want to be a man of God. Oh God, I want you to take me places. I used to look out from the top of the mountain when the sun would come up and I could see Interstate 40 weaving its way through the canyon, leaving Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I used to look out there at that ribbon of, of highway and my heart would ache. And I would say, oh God, let me go preach in the big places like Amarillo, Texas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let me go preach down in those places out there. In my wildest dreams, I couldn't have known that I'd be preaching at Faith Bible Church in the nation of Belize. Because mm-hmm. Interstate 40 doesn't come here. <laughs> When those disciples left the Sea of Galilee, they had no idea. But they left. They went. Three weeks ago, tomorrow, two weeks ago tomorrow, I was standing in the most violent prison in all of Colombia, South America. And I was preaching. And I thought about that little boy walking up and down the mountaintop, crying out to God. This prison that inmates at one time played soccer with a severed human head. Very violent place. And I stood there and preached and I saw 100 men raising their hands, tears running down their face, praising God. They they clapped so many times I hardly could get my sermon out. The Spirit of God was so heavy there. And if I had said no at that camp, in the mountains of New Mexico when I was 16. I missed that. And there's so many things. Think of all the things that between now and when you go to heaven that you'll miss if you don't live a life of passion. If you don't decide now that you are going to embrace reckless courage. Okay, what's the next thing? And it's similar, but a little different. I want to say that to live a life of passion, you have to embrace radical risk. Radical risk. They didn't know what they were risking when they stepped away from the shore of Galilee, when they crossed that imaginary line. They didn't know the risk. And we don't know the risk. But when those risks face us, when those things come up, I want to tell you that if you're going to have the kind of passion and the kind of joy that the men and women throughout history that have been mighty for Jesus knew, you're going to have to step into risk when it faces you. You're going to have a choice. You're going to have a choice. You're going to come up to that line, and everything on the other side of that line is unknown. It's a miracle gap out there. You jump off the cliff and you might grow wings. That's faith. Chris said to me today, his pastor used to say, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. And that's true. 
radical risk. I think about the Ecuador Five. How many of you know who the Ecuador Five are? Jim Elliott. How many of you know that name? Yeah, he was the leader of the Ecuador Five. They landed. They spent two years preparing. They landed. They met some Alka Indians. The, the Wanoni, I think they're called, actually. And within a few minutes, all five of them were speared to death. And you say, what a waste. They faced radical risk and they walked into it. Some of them had firearms and they refused to shoot the natives and were speared to death. You say, what in the world good came out of all of their young lives when the minute they met the people they wanted to win to Christ, they died. Well, missiologists tell us that from 1950 when they died until today, their story has inspired more missionaries to go out to all the nations of the world than the hundred years previously. They said, God, make us lights in the world. Jim Elliott said this, I pray, listen to this, I pray that the Lord might give you a daredevil spirit, consuming you with a passion that is called by the cultural citizen of Christendom fanaticism, but known to God as that saintly madness that led his son through bloody sweat and hot tears to agony on a rude cross and glory. I think of Ed McCulley, one of the Ecuador 5 that said this, I have one desire now, to live a life of reckless abandon for the Lord, putting all my energy into it. Maybe, he said, he'll send me someplace where the name of Jesus Christ is unknown. He wrote that two weeks before he was killed. God answered that prayer. And I hope God answers some prayers for us. The third thing I want you to think about as you pray for a life of passion is rugged determination. Rugged determination. There's one thing to start out. There's one thing to step across the line and leave the nets and leave the boats in a, in a moment of passion. It's another thing that when the going gets tough, to stay and to be ruggedly determined to finish with passion the same that you started. Rugged determination. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.3, Endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. I want to have a wartime mentality. Do you know if you just start thinking like you're in a war, everything will change? If you start thinking like you're in a war, then prayer stops being that little thing that you're supposed to do every day at some point because you're a Christian, and it starts becoming a walkie-talkie. You've seen those war movies where the lieutenant calls the radio operator over, and they're down, pinned down in the trench, and the bullets are flying, and he says, give me that radio! And he calls in the fast movers to come and bomb the enemy. You've seen those movies. There's nothing boring about it. That kind of communication, right? Well, if you start thinking like you're in a war, then prayer becomes that radio. And reading your Bible becomes sharpening your sword. Everything changes when you get a wartime mentality. When you start realizing that you can either be known in hell as a POW, or known in hell as a warrior that is feared. Either way, you're going to be known in hell. I don't want to be a POW. I want to be a soldier. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I went to Columbia in 2009 for the first time. Because my friend invited me five times and wouldn't leave me alone. And every time he invited me, I said, No, I have this going on, and I have this going on, and I have this going on. I'm doing this project, and I'm pastoring this church and I'm writing this book and I have five teenagers at home I'm trying to raise to be warriors for Christ and he kept on asking me and he kept on asking me 
And every single engagement I had that I told him I couldn't go because of fell through. I had just been awarded a contract to, uh, do, to build a building that was going to bring some money into my family and help me with my struggling little church plant. And the last night I told him I can't go was a Thursday night. And I said, brother, I can't go. I just was awarded this contract. I'm going to start this new project. And it's going to really help our church and our family. I have to, I have to do this. I walked in the next morning and my friend, who was a dear Christian brother, his face was ashen white. And he said, Matt, I'm so sorry. They canceled the contract this morning. And we have nothing for you. I said, that's okay. I know what's going on here. My hand was shaking as I reached down and pulled out my phone. As I walked out the door. And I was thinking all the way out, God, don't kill me. I will call this man and I will go to Columbia. I was scared. It was a healthy fear of the Lord. I called him and I said, okay, God took care of the all the excuses. Now if he takes care of the money, I'll go. And two days later, I got a call from a friend that said, Pastor Matt, I heard you wanted to go to Columbia. And I said, yes, sir. And my brother Richard said, well, pack your bags, because I'm paying your way. I went to Columbia the first time the summer of 2009. I spent 10 days, my 18-year-old daughter went with me, Beverly. I spent 10 days walking through the orphanages of Columbia, South America, loving on little love-starved children. And I got refreshed. I got a new vision. I got a new passion. I met a little girl the last day named Heidi. She was 12 years old, the cutest little thing you can imagine. She had been in the orphanage since she was eight. Before that, her mother was a prostitute in the coastal towns of Columbia, and she had bounced from place to place. And as I told her goodbye that night, after we had spent about two days playing together, as I told her goodbye that night, she was crying and she hugged my neck and I remember her tears on my cheek. And I got in that van. My friends pulled me into the van. We were almost going to miss our plane. And she was still holding on to my neck. And as I was pulled into the van, I turned and I buried my face in my friend's chest and I wept like I've never wept before, and I've never wept since. I cried all the way to the airport. I got on the plane. I cried all the way to Houston. And I promise you, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that I cried every day for three months. I could not get that little girl out of the bed. I would wake up in the middle of the night, and I would be like, hiding, 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 oh, God. Rugged determination. God broke my heart with something that would make me rugged in my determination. As I stand here today, I've been to Columbia 21 times in the last seven years. That little girl is now my daughter. And three weeks ago, this Saturday, I baptized her. After witnessing to her for five years. And every three months I would go see her. And for five years she would say, Poppy, I love you. You're a good man. And there can't be a good God. Or not all these bad things wouldn't have happened in my life. There can't be a good God. And I would say, there is. And I can't explain why. But there is a good God. And you'll meet him someday. And when you do, you'll know it. And last spring, she came to me. I was just fixing to preach. She walked up to me and she put my, her hand on my arm and she said, Poppy, I have something to tell you. I'm now a Christian. I'm following Jesus too. I did meet him like you said. And I baptized her three weeks ago. Rugged determination. Did I have the money to go on 21 trips to Columbia? No. I promise you, every single trip, I, I, I remember one time specifically I left and I had $11 in my bank account. And that was all I had in the world. But I had to go. And thank God, this is not about me. You've got to know that if you know me. Thank God, in the last seven years, over 30 kids have gotten adopted 
by people that I've taken to Columbia. And hundreds more kids have gotten sponsors. And Rebecca's moving there in August. My youngest daughter, Brooke, lives there now, and she's been there a year. And they're opening a house for girls that are on the street that are ripe for the human traffickers. And we don't know what all God's going to do, but we're going to keep being determined. Determined. Rugged determination. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep enduring hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to finish with this. The last one. For a life of passion. is renegade vision. Renegade vision. Don't take me wrong on this, but I think you all know what I'm talking about. If you are going to do something great for God, you're going to have to break some rules somewhere. You're not going to get it done obeying all the rules. And I'm not talking about the commandments. I'm talking about the rules. The rules that culture and society and and just our, our human nature place on us. You're going to have to be a renegade. You're going to have to go do some things that everybody says, that's crazy! And if everybody isn't saying you're crazy, there's something wrong. You've bought into a lie somewhere. Renegade vision. We need to be trailblazers. Brother Andrew said, if your vision doesn't scare you, then both your vision and your God are too small. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, God loves with a great love the man whose heart is bursting with a passion for the impossible. It's impossible on the other side of that line. But that's where God is. That's where the Holy Spirit is. That's where the miracles are. And that's where the deepest joy is. You can experience the joy of God on this side of the line. You can experience His peace. But if you want radical joy, if you want radical peace, if you want radical passion, if you want radical boldness, if you want to step into your armor and put the mantle on, and walk around knowing that God's hand is on you and there's an anointing around you and wherever you go, God's going to change people. You've got to step across the line. You've got to live with passion. You've got to be a little bit reckless. You've got to be a renegade. I went to Rwanda, Africa in January. And not because I'm this bold, visionary man, but because that little girl right there for two years would not leave me alone. Daddy, when you come to Africa, you got to come to Africa. you got to come see my continent. You keep going to Colombia and seeing all your daughters in Colombia. And what about my continent? And in January, I went to Africa. We went to Rwanda where... 20 years ago, this summer, they killed a million of their own people in the streets of the capital city where I was preaching, Kigali. You've seen the movie Hotel Rwanda? We drove by Hotel Rwanda. And the pastor said one night, Brother Mac, you're going to be preaching on the radio, the secular radio station in the city, and it's going to go out to a million people. And I gulped to it. And I said, let's go. We went into this little radio room and put the headphones on. I had been interviewed before, but I never preached on the radio. I had a translator. And I preached my heart out. You know, three sentences and then the translator. Three sentences and then the translator. And when I finished preaching, the DJ was crying. And the two pastors that were in the room were crying, and my translator was crying. And I was crying. And the Holy Spirit was so thick in that little radio room. And I said, wow. And immediately the radio station phone started ringing. They had given out the number right after my sermon. It started ringing and ringing and ringing. Later that night, the pastor told me that 67 people had called in to say that they were receiving Jesus as their Savior. 
But DJ said, Pastor, you have to come back tomorrow night and preach again. And I went back the next night and I preached twice. They recorded one and the other one I preached live. And that night over 40 people called in to say they had received Jesus. And I thought about that little boy walking up and down the mountains of New Mexico, crying out to God to make me a preacher. I have five countries in Africa asking me to come summer of 2016 and preach crusades in all their cities. I don't know how I'm going to get the money to do that. I don't know where I'm going to get the health to do that. I don't know where I'm going to get the power to do that. But you know what? I'm going to be reckless. God help me. I'm going to be reckless. I commit before you that I'm going to be reckless. And I'm going to be a renegade. I'm going to be rugged. And I'm going to go do it. And I don't know what your life of passion looks like. I don't know what God's got laid out for you. But please don't settle. Please don't settle for it. Please don't settle for it. God has so much more for you. Would you all stand with me, please, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed?